Welcome back, I'm Robert Breaker, and I've got a sermon for you this week on the subject of what will happen after the rapture. What exactly is going to take place after the rapture of the church? And I went ahead and wrote up here the timeline of the whole Bible from Adam all the way to the end where Jesus rules and reigns for a thousand years as the Bible teaches. And I want to go ahead and do this because um, I had several things bouncing around in my head this week of what to preach on. And I was going to talk about rightly dividing the rapture, then rightly dividing the tribulation. And, well, the Lord just gave me this title and this sermon, so I might visit those later. But the thought in my mind is we're very close to the rapture. The headlines will very soon read, Millions Disappear. Because the rapture of the church is biblical. I can't tell you how many comments I've seen on my videos and how many emails and phone calls I've gotten from people lately. And they all run around and say, there's no rapture. No, the rapture's not in the Bible. <laughs> and I just think to myself, do, do you guys even read? Do you even read what the Bible says? I love you, but please read the Bible. Because truly, the rapture is one of the most important events on God's calendar. And you've got to understand that. You've got to understand that it's in the Bible and it's there for a reason. And you've got to rightly divide. So turn with me, if you will, to the book of Revelation, chapter 1. And we have a book, it's called the Bible, that tells us the future and the past. So I've laid out the past here from Adam all the way up to today. We're about right here, right before the rapture. And then I'm going to lay out the future. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to focus in on this little period of time right here. The tribulation period, I'm going to try to make it a little bit bigger, okay, so I can show you what's taking place during this time of the tribulation. And I believe that the tribulation is seven years long, total. And I'm going to go through, I'm going to show you why I believe that, and why I teach that, and what the Bible says. And you realize, if you'll just go to the Bible, and what the Bible says, you'll know some things. What if I told you, I know the future, and I'm going to tell you the future? You'd probably go, no, you don't, you can't do that. Well, guess what? I have a book that's given by God that is a book of prophecy. Prophecy is telling you something before it comes to pass. And it tells you exactly what's going to happen. And I thought about this a lot lately, that when the rapture comes, there'll be a lot of people left behind. And those left behind, they need to know what's going to take place in those seven years after the rapture. So I thought, let's go to the Bible and let's look at that and let's see. But let's begin here in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. Revelation 1 and verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John. Now some people come to the book of Revelation and they say, well that book was prophecy way back when, but it was fulfilled in 70 AD. Interesting, because it wasn't written until about 100 AD. So how could it be prophecy, future events, if it was written after the things that you claim it speaks of. I don't buy that malarkey. I don't go with that teaching that the book of Revelation is already passed. That's called preterism, I believe it's called. No, it's a book of future prophecy. And it's prophecy that must shortly come to pass the way God's viewing it. Because with God, a day is a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. So in God's eyes, you know, it's just a couple days. But uh, in our eyes, it's been almost 2,000 years. But it's still going to come to pass. And so we have this book to tell us about the future. Let's read verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this, what? Prophecy. And keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. And that time is now. It was written as a book of prophecy almost 2,000 years ago about things that are coming to pass very, very soon. And if you have any wisdom whatsoever, and you want the truth of what's going to happen in the future, then you need to go to the book that is the book of prophecy that tells you what is going to take place. So the Bible tells the future. The Bible is a book of prophecy. If you go back to the book of Daniel, you find in the book of Daniel, way back over here, there was a guy named Daniel, and you go back and you look at Daniel, God gave a prophecy of 490 years. That was a prophecy. It was called the 70 weeks, and they were weeks of years. But only 483 of those have taken place up until there. And so what you have to do is you have to understand there's a final missing week of seven years. And that seven-year week is future. And the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation go hand in hand. 
And many of the things that the book of Daniel speaks about, so let me go back to Daniel chapter 9 real quick, and let me explain this to you. There is so much false doctrine out there today, it's incredible. What we need to do is we need to get into the Bible and read it for ourselves and not listen to everyone going around, well, this, 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 and saying whatever they want to say. No, the Bible warns us about being tossed about with every wind of doctrine. If you want to know the future, go to the Bible itself, not what that guy says or that guy says or that guy says. Go to what the Bible says. Now, this prophecy of 70 weeks is a prophecy to Israel. And that's what you got to understand. We are the church. We are not Israel. So you've got to understand that this prophecy was written to Jews. Okay? Now look at Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24. Daniel 9, 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to... And then it goes on. Who is thy people? Daniel was a Jew. And as a Jew, Daniel is writing to Jews about a prophecy to Jews. Look at verse 25, about their Messiah. Hmm. Verse 26, Messiah, a prince, and things like this. So you've got to understand that in the Bible, the book of Daniel is a book of prophecy. Look again at Daniel chapter 10 and verse 14. Now I come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. Thy people is Israel. So God gave them a prophecy to the Jews of something that would take place 70 weeks later. But that final week was dependent upon whether or not they accepted the Messiah or not. And they rejected their Messiah, so it was postponed, and that prophecy was divided. And there are many verses in the Bible that talk about that, and we can see that, and we can see God going back to dealing with the Jews again. And you know what? Many Christians for many years said God's not done with the Jews because all the prophecies in the Bible are for the Jews, so it can't be that God's done with the Jews. But in 70 AD, the Jews were kicked out of Jerusalem. And so from here to here, a lot of people that claim to be Christians said, well, God's done with the Jews, so all the prophecies are for us. And all the promises to Israel are for us today. That's called replacement theology, and that is wrong and how do we know that that is wrong? Well, first of all, that prophecy was for Israel. But secondly, Israel is a nation again. In 1947, something happened. In 1947, the United Nations partitioned the land of what they called Palestine and said part for Jews, part for Arabs. In 1948, Israel declared themselves a nation. Uh, May 14th, I believe it was, 1948. 1949, the Knesset which would be their governing body, was put in power. So 47, 48, 49, all in that time period, the Jews got back into their nation. But many people that claim to be Christian over the last 2,000 years said, no, no, God's done with the Jews. No, the Jews aren't ever going to get that land back. And they got the land back, and they're there today. And they say, no, 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 this is all past. This book of Revelation It's not going to happen. And yet, now they're talking about rebuilding their temple. Well, most of these Old Testament prophecies for the Jews back here were all dependent upon the Jews being in the land and in their temple. And in the book of Revelation, future prophecy, not completed, it talks about when the Jews are in their temple. So there is going to be a rebuilt temple. And they're talking about that now, and I'll get into that a little bit here. But have you heard about the red heifers? The red heifers? Um, there were five red heifers without blemish sent to Israel from Texas, I believe it was. And there's a reason for that. Now, I don't have time to read Numbers chapter 19. But go to Numbers 19, verses 1 through 12. In that passage, we read about a red heifer. And in Numbers chapter 19, verses 1 through 12, this red heifer was something that the Jews had to use for purifying. And they would sacrifice it unto God, and then they would take the ashes and put the ashes in the water, and that was the ashes for purifying for those people. Numbers 19, verses 1 through 12. Well, Israel now has those five heifers back. And it's been that long for them to be able to produce a red heifer without any blemish. But finally, through, I guess, um, having different cows with different cows, you know, and, and trying to uh, produce a certain type of, of, of a cow. They've finally been able to reproduce a red heifer without blemish. This is key to biblical prophecy for many reasons. 
and we will see that here in a moment. But because they have that red heifer, they are now speaking about, now we can rebuild the temple. Now, there was a famous Jewish scholar, and this is interesting, called, oh, let me say his name right. I hope I do. Maimonides. Let me see how you say that. His name was Maimonides. Maimonides, if I'm saying it correctly. This Jewish scholar, Maimonides, or Maimonides, however you say it, he said, and he was a Jewish scholar, and he read his Bible, he said that whenever we get the tenth time in history, the tenth time that they offer a red heifer, that will be the time when the Jewish Messiah will arise. So if you're a Jew, you know all these things, you know all these prophecies. Now, why would he say that? Well, there's been nine times in the history of the Jewish race that they have offered a red heifer. This will be the tenth time and they already have five of them over there, and this will be the tenth time that they offer a red heifer, if they do it, and when they do it. But one of their Jewish scholars said that time that it's done, the tenth time, that'll be the time that the Messiah shows up. Well, if you know your Bible, the Antichrist shows up first and says he's the Messiah, and they accept the false Messiah before they accept the true Messiah, which was their Messiah, Jesus, who died for the sins of the world. So, if you know your Bible, you can look at all this and go, wow, I understand what's happening. Because a lot of people are like, well, why do they have a red heifer? Where's that in the Bible? Numbers chapter 19, verses 1 through 12. Okay, I want you to know these things because I want you to know. Now, Maimonides, however you say his name, was basing this on Ezekiel chapter 36. So, we're going to do a lot of scripture today. I'm going to give you as much information as I can, as quickly as I can. But in Ezekiel chapter 36... The Jews knew their Old Testament, and they read their Bibles over and over and over. And he read Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25 through 29. And Ezekiel 36, 25 says, this is God speaking to Israel. And, well, look at verse 24. 24 explains it real well with these three dates. Ezekiel 36, 24, For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. 70 AD, they were dispersed. So that's called the disbursement. So the Jews were dispersed into all these different countries. And they were all over. And then World War II came about, and the Jews were able to come back into their land. So they were dispersed in 70 AD. Now they all came back. Now they're continuing to come back. And now the Jews are in their land. Biblical prophecy. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you. Now this guy, and I hope I'm saying it, saying it right, Maimonides, he says this is the sprinkling of the heifer's ashes in the water because that's what they do with the ashes they put them in water so he is reading his bible and he says then i will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will i cleanse you a new heart also will i give you and a new spirit will i put within you and i will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and i will give you an heart of flesh and i will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them and ye shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. And look at that verse 29. I will also save you from all your uncleanness, and I will call for the corn, and will increase it, and lay no famine upon you. Now, this is all passages of promises of God to Jews, written way back about 587 B.C., when Ezekiel wrote this, about when you leave the land, you'll come back to the land. Well, we see this historically in the 1940s, they come back to the land. But they have not rebuilt the temple to do what the statutes told them to do under the law, which was offer up that red heifer in order to do that, in order to do the uh, holy water, if you want to call it that, <laughs> uh, do that purifying through the water of the ashes of the red heifer. So this Jewish religious scholar said, I believe that the tenth time that we get to, in history, do the red heifer, that's the time that the Messiah is going to show up. So we're there, folks. Even the Jews are reading their Old Testament prophecies and applying it to them. We who are Christians, we're reading our Bibles and we're saying, hey, it's all coming to pass, just like the Bible says, because God is going to go back to dealing with Israel. Now go to Jeremiah chapter 30. There are some people out there today, though, that claim to be Christians, they say, oh, no, no, God's done with the Jews. That's, that's a very, hmm, what is the word I'm looking for here? Naive person. And that's a person that doesn't seem to know their Bible too well and doesn't seem to be looking at history and what's going on. It's almost like they're an ostrich. 
with their head in the sand. I don't see anything like that going on. <laughs> and we here are Christians, we're looking at the news every day going, look, look, it's all coming to pass, just like the Bible said. Uh, get your head out of the sand, get your nose in the Bible, and get your eyes looking and seeing, because it's all coming to pass, just like the Bible said. Okay? Jeremiah chapter 30. This 70 weeks of Daniel, this final week, this uh, final seven years, we call it the tribulation. But the Bible calls it the time of Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it. So this is called the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, there are some people out there that say there's no rapture. <laughs> okay, and they think we're going through this, the church. There's other people out there that say, well, I'm not pre-trib rapture, I'm post-trib or mid-trib. And they think the church is going into either all or part of this time period, this dispensation, the tribulation. Why would the body of Christ, the church, go into something that was for Jews? And it's a prophecy to them, that people. And it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. Do you remember who Jacob is? God changed Jacob's name to Israel. So it's the time when Israel finishes that Old Testament prophecy. So why would the church even be there? That's why I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, because it's a prophecy for them, not for us. Now there's many, many other verses that I could go into. By the way, in the New Testament, when it talks about the tribulation, the tribulation is divided, and we're going to see the verses on this, into three and a half years and three and a half years. But it's a total of seven. The tribulation, when we say tribulation, we're talking about the seven years. But the last three and a half years, the Bible calls the Great Tribulation. So I want you to understand that and know that, because sometimes I'll talk about the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation is the worst part of it. The last three and a half years, that's when the wrath of God is poured out. And that's when um, bad things happen. So that's the last part of the Tribulation, the Great Tribulation, the last three and a half years. Now, a lot more to go into. But let me just say that God is not done with Israel. So they will have a rebuilt temple. And by the way, they're already discussing about how they're going to divide the land. They're going to the United Nations. Have you seen this in the news? The, the land of Israel. And they're saying, we want to divide the land. Have you ever read your Bible? God says he's angry with Israel for dividing the land. Hmm. And yet we're seeing them do that, which is rightfully theirs, by the way, according to the covenant made with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. So we're seeing things come to pass. The next thing's going to happen is the rebuilding of the temple. And the Jews want to rebuild that temple so that they can sacrifice that tenth red heifer in history and do that. And they're all looking over in Israel for their Messiah to come. So the next thing on, on God's calendar is the rapture of the church. What will happen after the rapture? What will happen after the rapture? I believe in the rapture of the church. I believe it's going to take place because it's in the Bible. And I'm doing this video not to talk about the rapture as much as what happens after. Because I'm going at the rapture, and it's coming soon. And I'm concerned about people that are left behind and didn't go at the rapture. They didn't believe and weren't saved. Here's what you need to know, according to the Bible, is going to take place. So if you're watching this and the rapture took place, you can know what's going to happen next. And all I'm going to do is just take you to the scriptures and show you what's going to happen next. Now, the Bible says this will happen next. Two witnesses will appear in Jerusalem. And these two witnesses will be around for three and a half years. That will be their ministry, according to the Bible. I had a guy call me a, a year or two ago. He said, Brother Breaker, I'm going to move to Israel. I said, really? What are you going to do over there? He said, I'm going to wait for the two witnesses to show up. <laughs> and he said, I think they're showing up on such and such a day. And they didn't. He was a little off on his timing. But he wasn't off on the prophecy because the Bible teaches that there will be two witnesses who will appear in Jerusalem after the rapture. And they will do what they do. They will do a ministry, and they'll have signs and miracles, but their ministry will last exactly three and a half years. 
Let's read that together from the Bible. Let's go to uh, Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11, the Bible says, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. Okay, so this is a rebuilt temple. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Forty and two months is three and a half years. Okay, but it's interesting that the Gentiles have a court. You go over to Israel now, there's the Dome of the Rock. And for many years, people thought the Dome of the Rock was the actual location of the old Jewish temple. Now they're looking at historical records, and they're looking at things, and they're like, no, I think that was just part of the court, that the temple was a little bit over here. So it would be very convenient and easy to rebuild the temple right next to the Dome of the Rock, and that both places stand right next to each other. Wouldn't that be interesting? Wouldn't have a problem with biblical prophecy if that took place. But notice how specific the Bible is. Forty-two months is three and a half years. Now verse 3, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. Now, 42 months is exactly in days 1,260 days. And that is exactly three and a half years. So how specific is the Bible? The Bible tells you, 42 months, 1,260 days, three and a half years. This is where the two witnesses come. So the two witnesses come in at this time. So immediately after the rapture, people are going to be like, what's going on? Where would everybody go? What? And then all of a sudden, we interrupt this news break to tell you there's two people that are standing in Jerusalem, and they're two witnesses, and we don't know what they're doing or who they are, What this? but they just showed up out of nowhere. What are these guys doing? <laughs> now, a lot of people like to debate when it comes to this as well. A lot of people like to talk about this and say, well, I think it's these people, or I think it's that. The Bible clearly teaches that it's Moses and Elijah. If you go to the book of Malachi, those are the two mentioned in the end of the book of Malachi. Elijah will come, and then Moses. And as you read this passage, you find out they are Moses and Elijah. Now, some people say, no, it's Moses and Enoch. No, it's not. It's Moses and Elijah. You know how we know? Matthew 17. Go read Matthew 17 sometime and tell me which two you see there. It's not Moses and Enoch. It's Moses and Elijah. But let's continue reading here. These are the two olive trees. Now that's in Zechariah chapter 4. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any will hurt them, he must be in this manner killed. Elijah did that in the Old Testament. Do you remember? These soldiers came and he called down fire from heaven. More soldiers came, called down fire. Remember? That's, that was Elijah. Verse 6, These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them into blood. Okay? Who is the one that caused it to not rain? Elijah. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. Three and a half years, the Bible says, Elijah caused it to not rain. Here he's back doing the same thing. And then it says, And have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Who did that? Who took his staff and turned water to blood in Egypt? Who had the ten plagues of Egypt? Moses! So Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets, if you will. These are the two witnesses. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Where is that? Well, Jesus was crucified outside the city of Jerusalem. But now it's so big, it's encompassed that area where Jesus was crucified. So it must be speaking of Jerusalem. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put into graves. But then what happens? Let me skip down to verse 11. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying to them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. So these two witnesses witnessed for three and a half years, 1,260 days, and then they die. But then God, after three days, takes them back up. So what is going to happen after the rapture of the church? Two witnesses are going to appear in Israel. 
Now, why are they in Jerusalem? Because it's a prophecy to the Jews. So they're there to witness to the Jews for three and a half years until they are killed. Now, what else is going to happen? Now, I want to go as fast as I can to get through this, but I want this to uh, stimulate you to further study, if you will. I want you to actually read the Bible so you know what it says. There are people all over the place with what they're teaching nowadays. I've heard somebody say, well, the two witnesses, well, that's just the law and the prophets in the Old Testament. No, it's two literal men who are standing and wearing sackcloth, and they're standing in Jerusalem for three and a half years, calling down fire from heaven, turning water to blood, bringing forth plagues. They're literal men. They're not figurative. I can't tell you how many times people say, well, those are just figurative witnesses. Read your Bible and believe it, okay? Let's go then and continue here. The next thing is the Antichrist will appear. All right? The Antichrist, I'll just put AC, will take power. And he will rule over the entire world. Now, my thought, and I don't know for sure, but my thought is he will be the head of the United Nations. And when he shows up, he's going to rule for three and a half years. And the Antichrist at this time, is going to be known in God's eyes, now not in the world's probably, but in the Bible, he's called the man of sin. And the man of sin is over here. And the man of sin rules for three and a half years. And then he dies. Hmm. So the same time the two witnesses die, it looks like the man of sin dies. And you would know this if you read your Bible. Okay? Let's look at that. Let me show you that. So there's a person coming on the scene known as the Antichrist who will rule for three and a half years. And then we're told he's killed or assassinated. This is in Revelation chapter 13. And by the way, the Bible is so specific, it tells us where his wound is. It's his right arm and his right eye. That is in Zechariah 11:17. So if you miss the rapture and you want to know the future, be looking out for that guy that's got an eye patch probably and who has something wrong with his right arm. Okay? Because the Bible is very specific. Revelation chapter 13. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. This is the Antichrist. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. The dragon would be Satan. So Satan puts this man in power. Verse 3, And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him, watch this, to continue forty and two months. Forty and two months, three and a half years. So he dies... But then, after he dies, because he had a deadly wound, okay, some people go, well, he didn't die, it was just deadly, but it, it, he didn't kill him. No, a deadly wound means you are wounded to death. That's English, English language. A deadly wound means he had a wound that killed him. And somehow, he was able to reappear. Now, my belief is that he has the devil inside of him. And that the Satan himself comes back as the son of perdition. And so somehow the devil takes the body of the Antichrist after the Antichrist is assassinated, after he dies, and Satan comes inside of that and then raises up in that body and says, hey, no, no, I'm okay. Worship me. And what we find is that the Antichrist is now the son of perdition. There's two names given to the Antichrist in the Bible, the man of sin and the son of perdition. The Antichrist rules because Satan gives him power to rule three and a half years. But then he has a deadly wound. Now he comes back the final three and a half years. He continues three and a half years. The Bible says, I believe in a seven-year tribulation. That's what the Bible teaches. He continues three and a half years. But this time he continues with the devil inside of him. Called the son of perdition. Hmm. Is there another guy in the Bible called the son of perdition? Yeah, there is. His name was Judas. And you go over there to uh, John. And you look at, uh, I believe it's John chapter 13 and verse 27. The Bible says, and Satan entered into him. And Judas is called the son of perdition. So if the Antichrist is called in the last three and a half years the son of perdition, it's because Satan entered into him. 
if you read your Bible. Got to read your Bible, okay? Got to go by what the Bible teaches. Now let's continue here, verse 6. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy, okay? This is him continuing as the son of perdition. And he opened his mouth to blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Wait, tabernacle? That, that's a temple. <laughs> and we're going to see some verses here in a minute that during this time, he goes into the temple of the Jews and sits down and says, I am God. So in order for the Bible to be true, and it is, and the book of Revelation to be future, and it is future prophecy, there must be a rebuilt temple so that the Antichrist, when he dies and comes back, with Satan incarnate, so his body uh, dies, maybe his soul leaves, but somehow the devil is able to get back in that body and bring that body back to life. You know, they say they're experimenting right now with some things that are able to bring a body back to life. Hmm, it's very interesting if you keep an eye on the news and things like that. But the devil is going to be inside this guy. And then he's going to go into the Jewish temple, sit down on the mercy seat, and say, I am the true God. I am the Messiah of the Jews. And then the Jews are going to be like, oh, oh, no, no, oh, oh, we chose the wrong guy. They're going to see that he's not the right one because he's going to try to kill him. And all this is in the Bible. I'm trying as quickly as I can to get to it. Revelation chapter 13. So in verse 6, he blasphemes. Now verse 7, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints. Now people say, no, that's Christians. No, it's not. That's called Jewish saints. Because remember, the Christians left at the rapture. Now the Jews, the Jewish saints, the people of God back here were the Jews. The people of God here is the church. The church leaves. God goes back to dealing with thy people, Daniel, Israel. So that would be the Jewish saints. And he's going to overcome many of the Jewish saints. And to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Now it's also tribulation saints, those that in the tribulation choose Jesus and um, allow him to cut their head off. Okay, I'm going to make sure I put that in as well. Whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity, and he that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. He exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that should make an image to the beast that had the wound by a sword and did live. Okay, so somehow he was wounded to death, he died, but then lived. Do they have some sort of a clone of his body? And then the devil gets in a clone and comes? The image of the beast? I mean, if you clone something, that's an image. I mean, there's a lot of questions that we still have, but we clearly see the Bible telling us, um, man of sin, son of perdition, three and a half, three and a half, continues, so he's going three and a half, and he continues three and a half. There's something going on here. We're trying to figure it out. We that are Bible believers could have something to do perhaps with a with a, uh, a clone, but he was wounded unto death, he died, but now he has an image that lives. Hmm. Verse 15, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he caused it all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. What is this? You continue to read there. You can see verse 17 and 18. This is the mark of the beast. So he's causing this guy, the second beast. We call this the first beast. This is the second beast. He's causing people to take the mark of the beast. Notice that the mark of the beast is future. People running around today going, Oh no, I'm afraid. Did I take the mark of the beast? No, not yet. The rapture happened yet? No, then you didn't take the mark. Because the mark is over here. Not back here before. So you got to understand that. So the Antichrist reappears, the Bible says. The AC reappears as the son of perdition. And if you miss the rapture, you watch and you look for that guy who has a right eye withered and a right arm. And you'll know who the Antichrist is. The Bible is so specific and so easy to follow if you just read it and believe it. So we read there in Revelation 13, verse 10 through 15, and we just read it, that this son of perdition, this second beast, comes, and he has all sorts of miracles. So he can do miracles. 
and all the world will worship him and take his mark. So if somebody's in the world that's going around doing miracles, you better go, hey, I don't think that guy's of God. <laughs> Especially if you miss the rapture. But these will do the miracles. These two witnesses, they're doing signs and wonders. But you can recognize them because their right eye's not withered. And their arm's not withered. Signs are for the Jews, by the way, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1.22. So... Let's go over to 2 Thessalonians real quick, chapter 2. Let me read some more Bible to you. I just, again, I want you to know. One of the reasons why I'm doing this video is many people who are saved are saying to me, Brother Breaker, I, I want my lost loved ones to know what's happening if they miss the rapture. And I say, yeah, yeah, me too. What do I do? Well, first thing I recommend is that you write a letter. Call it the after the rapture letter. And leave it behind and say, dear so-and-so, your husband, your wife, your children, your aunt, uncle, whoever you love that you've tried to win to Jesus to go at the rapture and they didn't accept it, leave them a letter and say, okay, you missed the rapture. Well, here's what's going to happen next. Maybe even leave them a CD of this teaching. You can download this. I don't have DVDs. I don't make CDs or DVDs or things like that. But learn how to download this. You have my permission to download this video to a DVD and give it to someone. Leave it in an envelope. If the rapture happens and I'm not here, watch this, okay? That's what this is. I want people to see, if they didn't go with the rapture, what's going to happen in the next seven years and what they need to know. Don't take the mark of the beast. Be willing to die for Jesus by being beheaded, by being killed with a sword. Because that's the only way you can go to heaven in that period, according to the Bible. Now, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We read, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, now that is the rapture, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. The day of Christ is the rapture. So he's saying the rapture is coming. Now verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there be a falling away first. Interesting. Have you noticed how many people are on the internet, and they're playing soccer, and they just fall? Have you ever seen the videos where people are newscasters? Today, and they just pass out and fall. Have you noticed there's a lot of people all over the world just suddenly just falling for some reason? I wonder what that could be. Well, they're calling it something. What do they call it? Sudden infant adult death syndrome or something like that. Have you noticed that? And science is scratching their head. Well, we just don't know why so many people are dropping like flies and falling over. Interesting. Now, I believe it's talking about falling away from the doctrine of the truth, like many are today, saying, oh, there's no rapture. Well, that proves that there is, and it's coming. But it says, except there be a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, comma, the son of perdition. Now, some people read that, and they say he's revealed as the son of perdition. No, 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 no. Read it again. The man of sin is revealed. So this guy is revealed, and when he's revealed as the one world leader of the world... He goes for three and a half years, and then he dies. And then he continues with Satan inside of him for three and a half years. So I believe that we, the church, we can kind of get a glimpse ahead at who we think the Antichrist might be. And I think we can see who it is. Do you know what I just heard? It scared me, but I heard it. There are people out there calling Trump, Donald Trump, the Son of Man and the Messiah. Could he be the Antichrist? I don't know. All the world seemed to love him at one time. Now I don't know if they do. But I think that when the Antichrist takes over, as soon as he's revealed on the world scene as the one world leader, or perhaps he's someone who's revealed as back in power, if you will, boom, rapture takes place. And then that guy runs the world for three and a half years until he's killed. Then the devil incarnate somehow makes an image of him or gets inside that very body and somehow brings it back, or somehow makes a clone of it. I don't know how that works exactly, but the, the second beast is Satan. And the second beast is the son of perdition. The first beast is the man of sin. Okay, That's what the Bible teaches here. So let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there be a fallen away first, and that man of sin be revealed. And then it says, comma, the son of perdition. So the man of sin is also the son of perdition. Okay, It's the same, it sounds like it's the same body or same image of a person. But it's two different names. Why two different names? Because the first one is three and a half years. The last one is three and a half years. And in the middle, he dies. That's what the Bible teaches. Now, 
it later tells us the son of perdition, who, okay, so this is what the son of perdition does. The son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now watch this. That's the son of perdition. And the son of perdition goes into the rebuilt temple and says, I am God. I just showed you that. I just told you that. When does that take place? Not when he's the man of sin. Not the first three and a half years. It's after he continues, and it's here. So it's around this time that he's sitting in the temple, and he says he is God. And who is doing that? The son of perdition. So the Antichrist has a split personality. Okay, that's a fun video that I did on YouTube if you get a chance. The Antichrist has a split personality. Watch that video as well. But the Antichrist is two names because it's two distinct offices or two distinct time periods in which he rules. And he rules the first three and a half years as the man of sin. Then the last three and a half years, he's the son of perdition. Now, we can keep reading here. Maybe we should. Verse 5, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time? Now, who is this revealed in his time? The son of perdition. So we have two revelations. The revelation of the man of sin. Then, after three and a half years, the revelation of the son of perdition. A lot of people read this passage and get so messed up in it. You can't. you got to understand what he's talking about. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now some people read that and they say he is the Holy Spirit. And so look at verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed. So, oh, look at this. As soon as the wicked is revealed, then we're raptured in the middle of the tribulation. No, I don't see it saying that. A lot of people read this and try to make it the Holy Spirit. Others try, but let's just look at it. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, okay? Way back in the time of Paul, there was the mystery of iniquity, and it was working back then. World domination, that's what the Antichrist wants, to rule the whole world, doth already work. Only he who now letteth, and let means allow, will allow, or let, until he be taken out of the way. Who is the he taken out of the way? This guy dies so that this guy can come in. Could it be talking about that? And then shall that wicked be revealed. That wicked is a capital W. That wicked with a capital W. That is referring to Satan incarnate. So Satan incarnate. See, Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. Jesus is come in the flesh. He's still in the flesh. He's in his glorified body up in heaven. The devil wants to come in flesh, just like Jesus did. So the devil's going to incarnate a body somehow through an image. He's going to take the image of this first one over here. And so that Satan, that wicked, is this one, the revelation of the son of perdition. And look what it says. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. That's Armageddon. When Jesus comes back in Armageddon, who does he destroy? Does he destroy the man of sin? Or does he destroy the son of perdition? The son of perdition. Because he comes at the end of the seven years and he destroys this guy. So when you read the Bible, you need to rightly divide the word of truth and what it's saying. Verse 9, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Satan gives this guy the ability to do signs and miracles. But this guy too comes with miracles. And I, I would continue reading there. I don't have time. Let's move on. We've got other things to get to. But I want you to understand what the Bible teaches. If you read Daniel, if you be, read Revelation, if you read 2 Thessalonians, you cannot come to any other conclusion but seven-year tribulation. Divided into three and a half and three and a half. And the first three and a half years, the man of sin, then he dies. That somehow Satan uses his body as his mode of to function in the physical world, and he is there for three and a half years. That's when he sits in the temple. That's when he blasphemes and says, I am God. And that's when the devil incarnate is on this earth in the form of the Antichrist, but he's called that wicked one, and he's called the son of perdition. So, next thing here. What's going to happen in the future? Well, the SOP, the son of perdition, according to the Bible, will sit will sit on throne in the temple in Jerusalem. And what he's going to do when he takes over 
he's going to kick the Jews out of that rebuilt temple. And he's going to take over that rebuilt temple for three and a half years. And those faithful Jewish people who are worshiping in that temple, thinking they're truly worshiping God, they don't realize they rejected their true Messiah, those will have to flee. And do you know that's in the Bible? Now, there's a lot more I could get into, and we're going to get into that here in a minute. But the Antichrist will sit on the throne in the temple in Jerusalem and say he's God. We saw that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4. Let's also go to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Look at what it says here. This is what's called the abomination of desolation that takes place in the middle of the tribulation. Once this guy rises from the dead, okay, that's what he'll try to pass off to the world, that the man of sin died, but he came back to life. How that happens, I don't know. Is it a clone? Is it somehow through science he can bring back a dead body? Whatever it is, he's going to have the same image of the first beast, but he's going to be inside that image. And he's going to be tricking the people into believing that he is this guy. Okay, That's what I read as I read the Bible. And the Bible calls this the, the abomination of desolation because this guy will immediately go into the temple and tell the Jews, no more sacrifices. I'm your God now. And notice what it says. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understand. Then let them which are in Judea flee unto the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And it goes on there. Do you realize that this is not written to Christians? Many Christians believe Matthew 24 is for us and that we're going through the tribulation. How can you be so silly and not rightly divide and not read your Bible? Clearly, Jesus said he came only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The law and the prophets were until John. Uh, Romans 10, 4 says, For us today in the church age, Christ is the end of the law to all who believe. We're not under the Old Testament law. But as soon as the rapture takes place, it all goes back to Israel. And they're trying to get back under the law. They don't see God did what he did to save them from the law, because the law is a curse. So you don't have to be under the law. We're not under the law today. But those Jews will be trying to follow the law in that seven-year period. And Jesus, in Matthew 24, is speaking to them about what they're to do. And look what it says in verse 20. And pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, last three and a half years. Except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect, the elect's sake. That's the Jews in that time. We're already in heaven. We don't have to worry about being deceived. We're not worrying about taking the mark of the beast. False Christ arise, verse 24. And on and on and on. But look at verse uh, 28. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. That's the coming at Armageddon, not the coming at the rapture. And notice what it says when he comes. For whithersoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. You ever read the book of Revelation? When Jesus comes to the battle of Armageddon and defeats the Antichrist and all his armies, all the birds come and eat the flesh. That's Armageddon. That's not rapture. But some Christians go through here, and this is what's going to take place because the rapture is in the middle or the end of the tribulation. You don't know your Bible. What's wrong with you? Verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in the heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect, that's Israel, from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. This is not the rapture. Some people try to make this the rapture. No, this is way over here. <laughs> so why don't you rightly divide? Am I supposed to, if I go through the tribulation and the rapture's not until later, and I see the abomination and desolation in Israel and some guy goes into the tabernacle, am I supposed to get a flight? Am I supposed to fly to Israel and go into the mountains of Judea, Matthew 24, 16? No, this is clearly for Jews. Now, the Jews will flee Jerusalem. This is what Jesus was talking about. He was talking to them about the tribulation in Matthew 24. 
And they will be protected for, guess how long? Three and a half years. Go to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 13. Okay? So, do you see this in your mind? Rapture. Man of sin rules three and a half years. At the same time, there's two witnesses there for three and a half years. I'm sure he's like, I hate those guys, man. I sure hope I can kill them. After 1,260 days or three and a half years, he finally gets the victory over them and kills them. But then he's assassinated. Then somehow he comes back, Satan incarnate. And for the last three and a half years, the devil is ruling. But somewhere in the middle right here, the devil comes in, inside of that image, and goes in the temple and says, I'm God, and kicks all the Jews out of that temple. And they have to flee for three and a half years. Watch this. Revelation chapter 12. This is Bible, folks. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness into her place, where she is nourished for a time, times, and a half a time, from the face of the serpent. Time. If a time is a year, then that's one. Then it says times. Well, that's at least two. And then a half a time. So what do you got there? You got three and a half. Three and a half years. So three and a half years, the Jews flee because they're no longer allowed in their temple. Because now this guy's in there saying he's God. And they have to flee. And they're protected. Verse 15, And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened the mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So we see three and a half years. Now, we also see what will happen in the future. Ten kings will rule with, and I'll just call him the Antichrist, because both of these can be called and referred to as the Antichrist. The man of sin is the Antichrist, the son of perdition is still the same Antichrist, because they're both against Christ. But they have two different names because they're in two different time periods. And ten kings will rule with the Antichrist on earth. And guess what? They will hate Jesus Christ. They will seek war with God. They will seek war with God and with Jesus Christ. Now, why will they do that? Who knows? But they know who they are, and the devil knows that God is real. So when the devil takes over the world, he's going to try to keep it. And he knows his greatest enemy will be God. And let's go to Revelation chapter 17. So I just want to show you what the Bible says, and I hope you're saved and you go with the rapture. Because it would be sad if you missed the rapture and you're listening to this and you're living through this. I hope your eyes are open because the Bible says those that live through this, many of them will be deceived. Don't be one of the deceived ones. Have your eyes open, read the scriptures, and it's clear as a bell that the evil is going to take over this world. And the only hope is Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 17, verse 12. In the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. Now, in the world today, we don't have a lot of kings. But the queen just died. Now we have a new king of England. There's one king. I guess you just need nine more, right? Hmm. Interesting. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. What's the one mind? Globalism. The idea of a one world government. These shall make war with the lamb... That's Jesus. But it says, And the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And you keep reading down there, and it goes on, but I don't have time to read the rest of them, but you've got these ten kings that will be on the side of him. And they'll bring in what they call the new world, you know the word, order. And they will have their globalist system in a one world kingdom where the Antichrist will rule. Now, go to Revelation chapter 19 and verse 19. Revelation 19, 19. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Who is the him? That's Jesus Christ. 
Amen? That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they will try to make war against Jesus. But now we're in Revelation chapter 19. Look at verse 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet, that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. That's over here. Because this is the image on this side. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. There's your birds eating. That's Armageddon. That's clearly Armageddon. So Jesus wins against these ten kings. But after the rapture, you will see a one world leader take over, and he'll have ten kings under him. That's what the Bible says. And uh, if you read the Bible, you, you can tell the future. <laughs> you can do what I'm doing, tell you what's going to happen in the future. Well, what's going to happen? Jesus will defeat the Antichrist. And will rule. So you can choose to be on the side of the man of sin and the son of perdition. You can choose the globalist system for seven years. But you're going to lose. Because when Jesus comes back at Armageddon and sets up his millennial kingdom, you be gone. Okay? You gone. You know, like they say down south, he gone. You gone. You're out of here. Revelation chapter 16 and verse 14, the Bible talks about the battle of Armageddon. Revelation 16, 14. For they are the spirits of devils. You see, the devil has devils, unclean spirits or demons working for him. And they're getting inside of people. And they're getting people to all think the same way. And all these kings will be ruled by those seducing spirits. And they will all try to help the Antichrist get in power. And he will. And it's going to be a globalist system. But look what it says. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Why, what battle would that be? Verse 16, and he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Have you ever heard of the battle of Armageddon? That's the battle of Armageddon. Let's go to Revelation chapter 20 now. So the Antichrist comes in. Satan puts the Antichrist in power. The first beast, the Antichrist. He rules for three and a half years. Then somehow he's killed. The Bible says a sword in his right hand and right arm. But somehow the devil takes his image and uses it. Whether it's a clone, whether it's somehow bringing back to life a dead body, reanimating it, maybe. Um, but the Antichrist is now Satan incarnate. And he's going to go into the temple of the Jews and say, I'm God. And he's going to build an army. And he's going to do everything he can because he knows Jesus is coming back at Armageddon to try to defeat Jesus. He's going to have the entire world armies underneath his um, power. And he's going to try to fight against God. You think you can defeat God? Nah, won't happen. But he's going to try. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 1 through 6, we read, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up, and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. Right? This is the millennial kingdom. Millennium. Thousand. Thousand year reign of Jesus. So the devil's cast into a pit, but he comes back out of the end just to be defeated all over again. Thank God. But look at verse 4. I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them which were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So you see all this taking place for Jesus to win and to rule for a thousand years. But if you take that mark... You can't be saved. You've got to be willing to die for Jesus during this time period if you miss the rapture as a martyr. And the Bible says you will be beheaded. They have guillotines all over the world. And now there's codes in your, in your medical books of beheadings and things like that. It's all leading up to the mark of the beast. And those who don't take the mark of the beast will be beheaded. 
according to the Bible. Well, if you're beheaded and you tell them, I worship Jesus, I don't worship you, and they behead you, your soul goes to heaven. But the Bible says, but God will then bring you back and let you go through the millennium with him. So please don't take the mark of the beast. So Jesus... The true Messiah of the Jews will finally get his kingdom and will be their king. And the Bible says this in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. That's at the battle of Armageddon. And he shall rule them with the rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Whoo! <laughs> Jesus Christ is going to rule with a rod of iron. Are you ready to rule with him? I don't know who's listening to this. I don't know who's watching this. I don't know when you're watching this. If the rapture is not taking place yet, the gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And it's all about how Christ died for your sins and shed his blood for you. And the Bible says you're saved by faith. Faith is believing. Do you even believe the Bible? If you trust in that blood that Jesus shed and accept Jesus as your Savior, the Bible says then you will go at the rapture. And when you go up at the rapture, you don't have to worry about what's going on in the world. You won't be here. But if this is already taking place, the rapture, and now you're watching this video, this is your future. And this man is going to take over, and he's going to rule and reign. And he's going to want your worship. He's going to want your soul. Because taking the mark of the beast is literally selling your soul. And you've got to be willing to say, no. No, I love Jesus. I'd rather die than take your mark and worship you. A lot of people, man, they won't do that. A lot of people, because of peer pressure, will say, oh, just go ahead and give it to me. That'll be sad. I hope the rapture hasn't taken place yet, and I hope you get saved today. But if it does, here's your future pretty bleak. But there's good news. There's hope. The hope is in Jesus because ultimately he wins. Whose side are you on? The side of the globalist or on the side of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? The choice is yours. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.